morning, everybody. A special word of welcome to everybody at the Ascent, uh, to everyone at Union Cross and all who will be watching online. Are you ready for some good news? Jesus is supreme. His glory is the glory of God himself. And though he is fully human, and subject, subjects himself to the frailties of human life, we must remember at every point, he's God. And he's glorious and supreme over all. And there's tremendous hope. Today as we continue in the study of the life of Peter, we come to a rather neglected text. Uh, one that I have no memory of preaching, or certainly not in recent memory, on this story that we call the Transfiguration. I'll turn you to Matthew chapter 17, where we're going to learn today through the Transfiguration something that Peter was able to witness so that we can understand how Peter's transformation continues. And uh, today's message we entitled From Distraction to Hope. And there is so much hope that comes into your heart when you really understand the supremacy and the sufficiency of who Jesus really is. It's Matthew, it's chapter 17 at verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. There once was a burglar. They broke into a house in the dark of night, and as he was rummaging around for those precious items to steal, he heard a strange voice say, Beware, Jesus is watching you. He was caught off guard, and he paused for a moment, and in the stillness of the dark night, he heard the voice again, Beware, Jesus is watching you. He began to walk around thinking, What voice is this? It didn't sound human. He heard it a third time, Beware, Jesus is watching you, and he realized it was coming from a parrot. And he said, A parrot? What's your name? And he said, Moses. And the burglar said, what kind of people are so stupid to name a parrot Moses? And the parrot said, the same kind of people that named their Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we need to be reminded of the strength of who Jesus is. The passage today comes right after Jesus has first affirmed and blessed Peter for recognizing him as the Messiah. But then he has had to rebuke Peter because after telling his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die, and Peter says it may never be. And this is the place Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And it's after this that we come to this amazing story of the transfiguration. And part of the meaning of this, surely, is that as Jesus is describing to his disciples how much he's going to have to suffer and all the frailties of human life that he's going to experience and bleed and be killed upon a Roman cross, he lets Peter and James and John in on a moment of seeing him transfigured, of seeing him in his glory, of seeing him in all of his deity, and seeing him in his glorified state. It is like getting to see Jesus after he has been resurrected and glorified. 
It is like getting a glimpse on earth of Jesus in his splendor without the robes of humanity in just those moments. Jesus is gracious and Jesus is kind. Jesus blesses little children, forgives the sinners, feeds the poor, and allows himself to be mocked and beaten and crucified. But we must never forget that Jesus is Lord of all. And so it is that Peter gets this opportunity to see Jesus glorified. And what this means is essentially Jesus is saying, I will suffer, I will be persecuted, but I want you to remember that when they put the crown of thorns into my brow and they mock me, I want you to remember I really am the king. And when I bleed and I solely suffocate, I want you to remember that I am glorious. Remember that though the Son of Man came humbly and took on the form of a servant and became obedient, even unto death on a cross, that he is always and forever and always will be the glorious king of the cosmos, blazing with hot purity and transcendent supremacy. The transfiguration is a glimpse into the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about what it means to Peter and what this amazing story means to us. First, the word transfigured that is used here and from which we call this story the transfiguration is one of those Greek words that we all recognize in English because it came over into English almost exactly like in Greek. It's the word metamorphosis. This uh, Greek verb, as you would imagine, means to be transformed. He is metamorphosed. He's, he, is, he is Jesus, and in his humanity, he looked one way. But when he underwent the transfiguration, Peter was able to see him in his glory, but it's still Jesus. So it's like looking at a caterpillar. It is the butterfly, but the metamorphosis to the butterfly is like a transfiguration. It is one and the same. And it is a picture that um, we can see in Jesus what is assured to every believer will be our eternity as well. For as Jesus dies, we die. As Jesus was raised, we are raised. And as Jesus lives eternally in a glorified state, so everyone who's in Christ will likewise be glorified. So he's getting a glimpse of this, this metamorphosis. And part of the, the thing I wonder about with this is, as Peter and James and John were given the privilege of seeing Jesus like this, was this the only time it happened? And the more that I meditate on this, I thought, probably not. Maybe there are many moments in Jesus' life where he goes off and we see him going off to have time, just be with his Father. And maybe in those times, there are other moments where Jesus' radiant splendor is just on, in full view, but there's no one there. We don't know. But in this case, Peter gets to see it. And part of the, the mystery and wonder of the story of Jesus and his glory is highlighted by a book by R.C. Sproul on the glories of Christ, where he asserts that even though Jesus comes in such humility, and that the journey really is from humility to exaltation, that all throughout it, there are interjections of moments of his splendor that are visible to all. So, for example, at the nativity, at his birth, Jesus is a humble little baby. And he is in this very humble setting. And you couldn't be more fragile or more frail than a baby in a manger. And yet, just very nearby in the fields of Bethlehem, angels and their resplendent glory break through the clouds of glory, and shepherds are quaking because they've experienced the glory of God. Or uh, some time later, when Jesus is still very, very young, uh, an infant or a little bit older child, the Magi arrive, and they're kingmakers, and they've come to herald him as the newborn king. It, it's like the whole life of Jesus is filled with this 
paradox, this irony. He's humble. He is, he is human and he's vulnerable. And yet you keep seeing these interjections of the glory of God. And the transfiguration is, is like a prefiguring of all of this and symbolizes that in the midst of the weakness, in the midst of Jesus saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. He wants Peter to see, but I want you to know I'm glorious. It is typified on the cross when Jesus slowly suffocates and he dies as he bleeds on that cross. He is experiencing the weakness of humanity. But at the same time, it grows dark. And there's an earthquake. And the temple shakes. And the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the other courts is torn asunder. And the Bible even says that tombs were opened up. So in the moment of his greatest weakness, there is this incredible, incredible glory that is also taking place. There's something about this paradox that is so fascinating. I, I think this is why we have such remarkable fame to the song, Mary, Did You Know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Mary, did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb, that the sleeping child you're holding is the great I am? We're drawn in by such a mystery as this. And Peter got to glimpse it that day. And part of what this is about is the power of hope. This is part of what the transfiguration is about. Is seeing a vision of Jesus in his glorified state so that when you see him suffer, you will remain in hope of the glory that is to come. This is part of the intent. But I think it's also meant to bring about hope for the glory that is to come those who are in Christ. It's sort of like you get to see a glimpse of, of heaven, a glimpse of what it means when the Bible promises that you'll have a glorified body. Um, we, are, we are going to be as Jesus is. And what happens in the midst of a hope like this is that you become energized for your living today. I mean, years ago, I was preaching a, a series on heaven. And one day I preached a, a message uh, on the glorified body, the resurrection of the body, and uh, which is what the Bible teaches. I called it the body you've always wanted. <laughs> Afterwards, I was talking to a dear lady in the church and she was telling me how meaningful it was to her, this series on heaven. And it was such a blessing to talk to her, a precious lady. And then she said something that surprised me. She said, I've been trying for several years to lose some weight and been unsuccessful in getting motivated. She said, but for some reason during this series on heaven, I've really begun to become more disciplined and I've been losing weight. And I thought, well, that's just wonderful. But I walked away thinking, that's kind of odd. I wouldn't have thought that. In fact, you could almost imagine the opposite. That if you're talking a lot about heaven and how one day you're going to get a new body, you could see that somebody might say, well, I might as well just uh, live it up here, eat whatever I want to, because I'm going to get a new body one day anyway. You might think it would work that way. If you think much about the hope of heaven, that somebody would just get lazy in the world today. If we're going to go to heaven one day and it doesn't matter uh, so much, uh, then what I do? That's not actually the way it works. Why? Because when you think much of heaven, when you think much of the glory that is to come, what happens is your heart starts having hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is an inward sense of bliss accompanied by energy that is aware of something good that is coming. I've often said this, that hope, therefore, is typified in a little child a day or two or a week before Christmas when they have got so much energy and you, why are you so excited? 
because Christmas is coming. They don't know everything they're going to get, but they know something good is coming. And we're like that, you see. Um, if you're uh, running a, a race and you come around the bend and realize that you have a step or two lead over everyone else and you see the finish line and you start getting a hope that you're going to win. It's the idea of winning that gives the runner a boost. You don't come around the bend and go, I believe I'm going to win and then just go sit down. You run harder than ever. I'm a writer and I love to write uh, books but it's a lot of work. It is an enormous amount of work to produce a book. It's uh, not only in the conceiving of the outline and the ideas and in the writing of the chapters and the rewriting and the rewriting and the rewriting, but there also is work with editors and publishers and sometimes throwing away whole chapters and starting whole sections over again. And it's a lot of work to produce a good book. But I love to write. And what I have found is that when I have a contract with a publisher to write a book, I am energized to write the book. And I'm, I'm remarkably disciplined, whether it means staying up late or getting up early or taking uh, every spare moment on an airplane or whatever it might be to write. I find myself quite disciplined and energized when I know that I have a contract and the book is going to be published and it's going to bless people when I know that people are going to be blessed, when I know that the love of God is going to go into someone's heart, when someone's going to be able to learn and grow, I'm tremendously energized. But if I don't have a contract yet with a publisher, and all I'm doing is I'm working the ideas and I'm working the proposal, which is also a lengthy process, I'm less energized and I'm less disciplined. Because you could be working on a proposal, which I've done before, in which you present it to different editors or publishers and it's never published and if there's something that I think is never going to be published and it's not going to be a blessing to somebody it's very hard to to work on that uh, what I'm talking about is the principle of hope and I think part of what Jesus is doing here is he's allowing Peter James and John to see him in his glorified state so they see who Jesus really is and who he's going to be but he wants them also to know so that it will make sense to them later on that just as they have beheld his majesty, that also we will be resurrected and glorified. Think much of the glory that is to come and it doesn't make you lazy here and now. It energizes you because you're sure that you win. It's only when you are not sure that you win that you think about giving up. And that's the power and the principle of hope. But let's go a little deeper with the story of the transfiguration for something that's absolutely intriguing and fascinating and where I've spent much time meditating and being enthralled by this. And that is that in the transfiguration, Jesus is there in all of his resplendent glory. And would it not have been enough for Peter and James and John to just simply see Jesus? But instead, what they're given a glimpse of is Jesus in all of his glory, but in the vision, there he is talking to Moses on one hand and Elijah on his other. And so Moses and Elijah are pictured here on this mountain with Jesus. And the first thing to say is that there are very clear comparisons symbolically of these three. And I want to start with Moses by going back and referencing some texts. If you want to follow along, it's in Exodus chapter 19 where I start. And this is Moses and his instructions is he's going to go up to Mount Sinai. And listen to uh, some of the narrative. Moses, Exodus 19 verse 17, brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like a smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. You notice the similarities of this? In the transfiguration, there's a cloud of glory, and God speaks out of this cloud, and the disciples are so fearful 
of this probably thunderous voice coming out of the clouds. And in Exodus 19, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now later, um, we read that in Exodus 34, Moses is having another meeting on Mount Sinai with God. And this is after Moses has requested that he see God's glory. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, Exodus 34, 29, with two tablets of testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned, and Moses talked with them. And afterwards, the people of Israel came near him. And when Moses finished speaking, he put a veil over his face. And whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses. The skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again. So now we have not only the picture of Moses who meets with God on a mountain, there's a great cloud-like uh, glory that is there, a thunderous voice that comes out of the cloud. But we also see that Moses, uh, in some similar way to Jesus, when he meets with God, is shining. And then we have the story of Elijah. And uh, Elijah's representative of the prophets of Israel. And one of the most important stories in the Old Testament is one of the most important stories, of course, with the narrative of Elijah. And this is Elijah confronting uh, wicked king Ahab and Jezebel because all of the idolatry in the land. And what Elijah does as the prophet of God under the leading of the Holy Spirit is he challenges uh, the prophets of Baal to meet at Mount Carmel. And so they go up on this mountain and Elijah has said, here's what we'll do. We'll set up two altars and we'll call upon God to come consume the altar with fire. And if your God Baal comes and consumes the altar with fire, we'll know Baal is the real God. But if my God does, then we'll know that the Lord is the true God, Yahweh. And so they meet in 1 Kings chapter 18. And all the prophets of Baal, 450 of them are gathered. And they start calling upon Baal. And nothing happens. And so they call louder. And Elijah actually mocks them and says, verse 27, cry, cry aloud, for he's God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself or he's on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. This is what Elijah is saying. It's just one of the funniest scenes in, in the Bible. Elijah is so confident. He's actually mocking these prophets. And He's, they believe and they say, well, maybe we need to just call louder. And then they lacerate themselves and, they, and nothing happens. And then Elijah, verse 30, said to all the people, come near to me. And the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bowl in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and put it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he did a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you've turned their hearts back. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them. Ha! Huh. That's Elijah. Elijah is this powerful prophet of God. And he also had gone up to a mountain. This is not the only time that you see Elijah calling down fire. Another 
incredible and intriguing story in 2 Kings 1, verse 9. The king sent to him, to Elijah, a captain of 50 men with his 50. And he went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And they sent him again, and the same thing happened again. You see these similarities. That you got Elijah and Moses, who both had these remarkable power encounters of God on a mountain. And fire and cloud and smoke and people falling in great fear. And Moses' shining face. Elijah and Moses, though not transfigured, they both are important Old Testament characters who in the narrative we see in their lives they are transformed. Moses and Elijah have this in common. They are vessels of God's power for wonder-working miracles, but they also both have this in common. Both are used to bring judgment against the enemies of God. Moses is used by God to bring judgment against the evil of Egypt and Pharaoh who had enslaved the people of God. And Elijah is used to bring judgment against Jezebel and Ahab and the worshipers of Baal and against the idol himself. And the midst of this, there's this cloud and the power of God speaking. And you can see all these similarities. So all of this is called, is called to mind. Um, but there are distinctions, obviously. And this is where I want to center our attention for a few moments. Jesus is transfigured, but Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, they're not transfigured. They're seen there. Peter sees them. They're talking to Jesus. But they're not resplendent. They're not, they're not glorious. They're not shining. Jesus is. And what's different, it's interesting when Moses met with God, his face would shine, but they put a veil over it and it would block the, the brightness of his face, whatever was happening. But the glory of God is different in Jesus because Jesus is God. And so what happens is, is his radiance shines forth into his clothing so his clothing are as bright as light. So as his whole being is light, his clothing is like light. And I don't have the, the understanding of physics well enough, nor the time to even venture forth. But if I did, it would be worthy of much meditation about all that the Scriptures point to. In the beginning, the first thing God said is, let there be light. And that Jesus called himself the light. And that what light is, is energy and the colors that we see are actually refracted light and it's fascinating so in his glorified state the revelation that john gets of on the isle of potmos of the heavens he's seeing that there there's no sun there's no need of a sun in heaven because god himself is the light it's a it's a remarkable thought so it's, it's not at all like the like the radiance on Moses' face, this is something that's it's altogether glorious. And the glory of God in Christ is not like the glory of other earthly kings who have accomplished things or have been heralded by others and adorned with the signs of their royalty. Because this is a glory that is radiating from within. It is the essence of who he is. And so Jesus stands out in distinction from this. I was thinking a lot about the part of the sentence from God where the Lord says, the Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The same words that were spoken at His baptism, and as I have made previously this assertion, that this combines a reference from Psalm 2 that speaks of the Son, who is the King, 
And also Isaiah 42, which uses the exact phrase, in whom I delight, which there is describing the suffering servant. That in this phrase joins together the heralded king and the suffering servant. This is my son, who is the king, in whom I delight, the suffering servant. But here, the Lord adds, listen to him. I just think it's so strange. I think it's so strange, and I thought so much about this. Listen to him. Well, of course we need to listen to Jesus. Was, is the transfiguration needed for the, God to be able to say to these disciples, you ought to listen to Jesus more than you're listening to him? I don't think so. I think, I think that what I, I imagine the tone of the voice and the emphasis of the voice to be this. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. It's not time to be listening to Moses, the representative of the law. It's not time for you to be listening to Elijah, the representative of the prophets. Listen to him. He's the all-sufficient one. Listen means obey. Listen means build your life upon. Listen means to reorganize every part of your being to line up with Christ. Don't build your life on the law. Don't build your life on the prophecies that say the kingdom will one day come. All of this now has been fulfilled in Christ. Listen to him. It is to say that Jesus stands there at the transfiguration between Moses and Elijah making sense of Matthew 5, 17, how he begins his Sermon on the Mount, and he says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. See, that's the phrase, <clears throat> the law or the prophets. An oft-used phrase, the law or the prophets. Moses is the symbol of the law. Elijah was the character who was the symbol of the prophets. Do not think I've come to abolish Moses and Elijah, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It means to fill them to the full. It means to complete them. It means, it means to fulfill in such a degree that everything has changed. So Jesus fulfills the law. Not by saying that what you do doesn't matter, but by saying that he is doing what we could never do. He says, on the cross it is finished. And he means that now, for the first time since Adam fell into sin, a human being has kept the law. A human being has filled it to the full. Now, saying it is finished, the promises of God have found their yes and amen that the prophecies were all pointing to Jesus. And so when Jesus says it's finished, what he's saying is that I have fulfilled the law and the prophets. I've fulfilled Moses and everything he instructed. I have fulfilled Elijah and what all the prophets pointed to. And so every prophecy of the coming of a Messiah who would save his people and redeem the world, every promise of the love of God, every promise that God would make his dwelling with us, every prophecy fulfilled in Christ, every law fulfilled in Christ. There was a law of a Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't work on that day. And Jesus came and said, I am the Sabbath. In me, you don't have to work for your salvation. He fulfills the Sabbath. There was a Passover where you're to slaughter a lamb and eat a feast so you could remember the deliverance of the people of God out of their bondage. And Jesus came and he is our Passover. He has fulfilled it. He has taken the Passover and filled it full and completed it. He's our Passover lamb. In him, we have been forgiven once and for all. And his blood has been sprinkled in the heavenlies. He is what Moses could never be. He is what Elijah you could never be. He is the all-sufficient one. Jesus is supreme and glorious and he is full of splendor because he came not only to identify with humanity but to be what humanity could not be so that we could be saved. He stands there between the law and the prophets and he says, I have fulfilled all of this. And Peter and James and John have been taught all their lives to build their life, to listen 
to Moses and listen to Elijah to study the law and study the prophets. And now God is saying the Old Testament shadows have found their reality in Jesus. See, a shadow, and that's what the New Testament says the Old Testament is, is shadows of that which is to come. What is a shadow? You can see your shadow. There's a light that shines down on me right now. I can look down. I can see my shadow. If you move and you see a shadow, you can tell, oh, there's the likeness of a human being. You can say, there must be a real person there because I see the shadow. But once you see the real person, you don't need to look at the shadow anymore. Why spend time on the shadow when the real person is there? This is why Paul got so, so frustrated, so angry with the Galatians who were trying to drift back into little laws like circumcision. They are little shadows. He's saying, don't return to the shadows when, when the reality has come. There's only one time when there's not a shadow, and that's when the sun is at full noonday brilliance. And if the sun shines directly down on you, there is no shadow. And here's Jesus transfigured in the fullness of the glory of God shining down upon him. And it's as if to say there are no more shadows. Now the reality has come. And they fall down. And Peter, we don't have time to talk about it. Oh, Peter, he wants to set up these tents. He always wants to do something religious. People encounter God and they don't know what to do with it. And so they want to set up some kind of religion. Let me make you a little shrine here. I'll try to do something for you. <laughs> and he admits in the whole, the whole point of the whole matter, Peter gets to see something that will only make sense to him later. Now, in this picture of the judgment of God that goes through Moses, the Red Sea that swallows up the people, and the judgment of God moves through Elijah, and fire that falls down at Carmel, and fire that falls down when he calls it from heaven upon the enemies, all of this <clears throat> leads me to a couple of other interesting thoughts. In Luke chapter 9, when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. <clears throat> and when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. So in Luke chapter 9, when the disciples see that people are resisting Jesus, they're like, well, we're with Jesus now. We're like Elijah. You want us to tell some fire to come down and consume them? Jesus said, you're missing the whole point. They're hearkening back to Elijah. But then in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Now well, this is just strange that Jesus says over and over and one way or another the Son of Man came not to condemn but to save. Jesus says I came not to condemn but to save. He came to love. But here he says I came to cast fire on the earth. Well which one is it? Did Jesus come to show kindness and mercy and save the lost? Or did he come to cast fire on the earth? Tim Keller has a wonderful point in reflection on this, saying that what really the proper reading of this text, when he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished, that he's really echoing what he's just said. Jesus has already been baptized with water. What's he referring to? He's referring to the immersion in the sufferings of this world. He says, I got a baptism. I'm, I'm going to be baptized in suffering. I'm going to be immersed in the suffering of this world. I'm going to be immersed in the pain and the judgment of, of this world and all that sin has meant. The reason that there wasn't fire called down on the Samaritans is the same reason there's not fire called down upon you and me or anyone else who's in Christ. And that is because Jesus did come to save the world and Jesus did call to bring fire down, but the fire fell on him. The wrath of God came on Christ. 
And he was immersed into the judgment that you and I should have experienced. Moses was an instrument of God's judgment against Egypt, and Elijah an instrument of God's judgment against Jezebel. But Jesus was the instrument and recipient of the judgment of God against all sin forever and ever. And so it is that Peter and James and John, they fall down on their faces and they look up. And Moses and Elijah are gone. And the text says it was Jesus only. Because in the end, you don't need the law and the prophets and Moses and Elijah and judgment. And if you have Jesus only, it's all you need. And that's the gospel.